Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second poster session of IST 2021. We had a great session yesterday, so I'm excited to see what we have in store today. Uh, just a reminder, there is a student poster session competition that's part of this session and yesterday's session. Uh, I'd like to thank our poster session sponsor, Earthship Global, for their continued support of the poster session and student poster competition. Earthship Global ha has had an integral role in supporting and helping our uh, conference for many years, and we definitely couldn't make this happen without them. Today, we again have four poster presenters that have requested a few minutes each to discuss their poster submissions. I'll introduce the poster presenters individually. Uh, when you join the podium, please introduce yourself and share your screen. After a few minutes, we'll open a Q&A before the next poster presenter joins the podium. If there's time at the end, other poster presenters may request to also share their work. We've set aside the final 20 minutes for Jonas Bohm to present. Uh, as with any traditional poster session, please feel free to browse the posters and chat with the presenters as we go. Uh, so I think we're going to kick off today with Aileen uh, Babu sorry, Bambukian? Bambukian. Bambukian. I apologize for that. That's OK. All right. Um, I, will I will share my screen. Hi, everyone. My name is Alim Pambukian. I'm a PhD student in public policy at Georgia Tech. And today I will present to you my project uh, titled Conventional Agriculture, Greenhouse and Hydroponics, NLCA of US Lettuce. As the title suggests, our focus was on US-based data. And we established a system boundary of lettuce cultivation and lettuce delivery, as we see here in the systems boundary. And we went with a functional unit of one kilogram of lettuce to do our cradle to gate life cycle assessment. In order to start, we collected our data from literature uh, pay, uh, publications as well as the USDA database. And um, we found out that um, conventional farming, no matter where we uh, are doing our farming, we have higher uh, consumption of water per kilogram of lettuce as compared to greenhouse and hydroponics uh, farming where we have higher energy requirements with hydroponics farming having the highest electricity needs. Moreover, uh, moving to the second column, the nutrients used of conventional farming were higher than that of greenhouse farming and hydroponics farming as well as the pesticides used. So in order understand what um, impacts these life cycle um, inputs have of the different types of farming, we wanted really to uh, answer how do different types of farming impact the environment. So we calculated the GHG emissions and we found out that the hydroponics farming has the highest GHG emissions um, with its major component being the electricity use. And uh, for greenhouse, we have heat energy, Whereas for conventional farming, the main major one was um, transportation. In order to better understand how it impacts human health and systems, we did the recipe um, uh, life cycle impact calculation. And we found out that the hydroponics farming and conventional farming have similar impacts of disability life years per kilometer. However, they differ in how they impact the human health, and that is hydroponics has higher global warming potential, while conventional farming has more impact on water consumption and um, non-cancerous toxicity. Um, whereas on the ecosystem, we realize that our results tell us that the 100% of its impact are due to land use for all three types of farming. Moreover, we also wanted to see uh, what are other uh, things that may make one type of farming more appealing than the other. And we find out that the yield tons per acre of hydroponics farming are about 20 times more per acre than that of greenhouse farming or conventional. So as a conclusion, the main takeaways of our calculations for finding out what are the impacts of these three types of farming on um, on the environment, we can say that hydroponics farming is not environmentally superior than conventional farming or greenhouse. And even though they, um, the conventional farming and hydroponics have similar human health impacts, but because hydroponics has long-term global warming uh, potential impacts, it's different than how important and immediate it is to take action for improving conventional farming as it affects uh, freshwater consumption. 
another uh, important conclusion is that land use is the main impact on ecosystems. And an interesting takeaway is that since um, our results show that greenhouse farming and hydroponics farming have similar impacts, um, even though they differ on the total amounts. So whenever we find technologies and innovations to improve one of the, uh, the technologies, whether hydroponic or greenhouse, we will be also improving the other one. And finally, this is very important because we have done our life cycle um, uh, assessment using US-based data. And um, this can be a building block in creating life cycle inventories for U.S. crops, vegetables, and fruits, in, um, and uh, creating life cycle inventory databases that can be accessible for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, if there are questions, we have an open podium. Feel free to, to join that. Um, but I guess uh, just a quick question. I may have missed it. Was this U.S. average uh, farming that we were looking at? Yes, especially. For uh, U.S. Uh, conventional uh, farming, we had all our data from the USDA. So we had a specific data for each of the states that I had in the slides, um, California, Arizona, and Georgia. And uh, the only one that was an average of global uh, data was greenhouse because the data doesn't have a specific um, pesticides and nutrients used for greenhouse um, farming. Whereas for hydroponics, excuse me, for hydroponics, we leaned on um, company data and literature review um, averages, but uh, with verification that they are applicable to US-based data. Of course. Um, would you anticipate uh, maybe significant differences based on region of the United States? Say maybe the Northeast looks significantly different than California? So um, we did a comparison between Georgia and um, uh, California, which is the Southeast rather than the Northeast, mm -hmm. but we saw a significant uh, difference and that is because the climate difference. So we are here in Georgia, very um, water rich, whereas in California and Arizona, there's a drought going on, which is why it is very important. Our results showing that the water consumption results of the conventional farming are the main uh, things to focus on in improving. Um, Sandy asks or says, excellent presentation. Did you see lettuce versus bacon storytelling in scientists and journalists communications about LCA, Andrew James Beardy? Um, I haven't seen that, but it is very um, interesting. I would be interested uh, to see how it relates to our um, project as well. If you have any more information, please um, send it to me on the chat or feel free to tell me. Uh, fantastic. Uh, if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat or join the podium. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll open this up at the very end, or you can mingle in the poster session and, and get all of your questions answered. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, coming up next, we have uh, Donna Vicalis. Hey, hi everyone. I'm um, presenting. Um, I'm presenting the project Municipal Energy and Emissions Database. My name is Donna Vicalis, uh, but this is a really a team effort. And one of my colleagues who worked on it is here in the room, Marcus Williams. But another key teammate was um, Noah Purvis Smith and Yul Herbert, who weren't here. We are um, working. So even though I was still in school, doing my PhD when. We um, were working on this, but this was really under the auspices of our um, of the cooperatively run companies that we work for, Sustainability Solutions Group and What If Technologies, with support from Enercan. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And I'm going to share my screen, which I just have to figure out how to do. So bear with me. Here we go. I think I think this is it. So now I'm going to take you to a Miro board and you'll notice I've put the link to this Miro board in the chat, which means that you can peruse this either now while I'm showing it or later on, you can come and navigate, you can zoom in and out and take your time with it. And so this is the project. This is a nice little headline graphic, Mead, 
And here's the website, mead.info. So this is actually a product in a way, uh, product is a weird word to use, but it's a tool that is live right now in beta form online. So you can actually go to mead.info and see it for yourself. Um, I'm gonna go really quickly over the rationale and objectives, because in this group, I think you're really well-versed in the need for climate action planning. One of the things we know is, you know, um, what gets measured gets done an old adage, and we are helping communities to produce an inventory. An inventory is something that is a step in action, climate action planning, but it, it's a step that can sometimes be as a barrier because, well, it takes time and expertise and money. <laughs> so this is where Mead steps in. We are creating inventories. Um, we started for the baseline year 2018, but it's the idea is to do an annual inventory for free um, that the public, it's publicly available online and we are doing it for all the census subdivisions. So that stats can speak for municipalities. So basically in Canada, you have 5,000 or a little more of these municipalities and we've done one for every single one of them. So if you go to the website, um, what you can pull up for any given municipality is this um, GPC report. So that's an international standard or protocol for reporting on greenhouse gas inventories. And basically what we've done here is we've taken data almost all from publicly available data sources um, and we've combined them to get as close as we can to a really good estimate of the greenhouse gases in all the different GPC categories. So those categories are things like stationary energy, so buildings, and then subsectors of those, so different kinds of buildings, then transportation energy and um, agricultural uh, energy and industrial processes. And we've combined these nine data sets in a way that I'm going to walk you through one example um, of how we've done that for one particular subsector. So I'm just going to glide over here. I'm zooming out on the board. Sorry if anyone gets motion sickness. And saying, for example, in your inventory, one line of this inventory is residential buildings. So we've done this for every line pretty much, um, but I'll walk you through residential buildings only because we don't have a lot of time. For this category, we start with StatsCan data from census data of different types of dwellings. So those are things like in your community, how many apartment buildings are there, how many mobile homes, et cetera, et cetera. Then we multiply that by a factor of how much energy in gigajoules um, per unit per end use. So things, end uses are appliances, cooling and heating, water heating and lighting. Um, these factors are first, they're um, specific to the provincial level. And then secondarily, we tweak them based on heating and cooling based on something called heating degree days and cooling degree days. Um, and that I'm happy to go into way more detail at another time. I'm just gonna keep on going to the right because the next step in the process is then to break it out by fuel tech. Basically, what kind of technology do you use for your end use? So for heating, it can be a number of different things. Maybe you have a high efficiency natural gas boiler. Maybe you use a heat pump. So we take shares um, that are calculated based on um, again, Statistics Canada stock counts, like the stock of which types of technologies people use. And then we multiply those by efficiency factors. Um, and these are based on co combination of research and experience working in climate action planning. And then we take that total and we kind of loop around a calibration loop because we need to make sure the total adds up to the provincial totals. And so we go through a calibration loop. We kind of go around the circle and we tweak the intensities, and then we come back again. So we get these calibration cycles that sort of look like this until we settle on the provincial total. Um, and that's almost the end. Now we just multiply the energies um, total. So we have all the energy by different fuel types. Uh, we imply, multiply those by emission factors, either for the fuel or if it's electricity, we have a kind of provincial grid um, average. And that gives us one entry in this whole GPC report. So if you go to the website later and look around, you'll see there's visualizations where we've provided the data. For example, here's an emissions breakdown and we provided 
breakdowns by all the subsectors and then give you a kind of summary per capita. Um, and the whole point of this, as I said in the beginning, is really to give communities an inventory, but we think it's really powerful because it's it's aligned on a national level. You have the same methodology for every municipality, so you can really compare one to the other. And it breaks down that barrier by giving this for free to everyone. So it's kind of like a head start. Um, you can get up and running in climate action planning and just, um, there's a, a lot of different applications. And we're working on right now on improving the numbers. So you'll see it's in beta, but um, we're working on the next release within a month. So that's the end of uh, my presentation. I feel like there's a lot there to unpack. <laughs> I'm curious to hear if anyone has any questions, wants to go into any details. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Donna. That was, that was excellent. Uh, I would encourage anybody in the audience who wants to engage to, to join us on the podium, or uh, again, you can ask questions in the either the, the question feature or the, the chat feature uh, like Sandy. Uh, for the last presentation. But yeah, you um, did a really nice job laying that out. I'm curious if you could uh, just briefly, you mentioned there were a lot of different applications. Maybe you could give us a sense of, of what you envision some of those applications are. Yeah, thanks uh, for that. So the most kind of um, immediate application would be for someone from a municipality, especially a smaller one, like let's say most municipalities in Canada are fewer than 10,000 people. So. Um, you have someone who works for a municipality, they want to do climate action planning, they need to know what their baseline is, um, and they need it on a standardized way. So the very first thing they might find out is that they need to produce one of these um, GPC inventories, or they might just want one anyway. And so now they're at a point where, okay, do we um, fork over $10,000, $40,000 for one of these? Um, and then maybe climate action planning starts to get um, kicked around as something that's a little like, you know, Im impossible or difficult to do. And instead this is like handed over and, and a, a starting point. The other thing is um, that same municipality might want to um, improve on some of the numbers. So rather than use our estimate, they might want to insert some of their own utility um, counts, like numbers that they have at hand. And so we're working on making that possible too. So that would be like, that's kind of like the main use case scenario. I sure, oh, that's, that's great. Uh, Julie Chen in the audience asked uh, if you considered uncertainty in the model or the, sorry about that. Did you consider uncertainty in the model uh, data, et cetera? So um, not in the usual way where you would do a sensitivity analysis um, but because we're then taking our estimates and comparing them side by side in two ways with provincial totals, so we know they scale up to the provincial totals, that's kind of one check. And then the other quality assurance that we're doing is looking at our numbers versus inventories that have been calculated independently and seeing how close or how far off they are. Um, in our first go around, it was really interesting because we had done some decisions like attributing, um, let's say, let's say you attribute a, a, attribute industrial emissions to where the people are working. Um, you might have like a large mill or a large something in the community, and then all of those emissions technically get associated with that geographical area. But in other inventories, someone might make, make the decision that those are not consumed locally, so you might attribute them elsewhere. So we're um, we're we're not only looking at uncertainty, but looking at how you explain to the public our decisions versus other possible decisions about where to allocate GHG emissions. Um, Alicia asked in the chat, I'm not sure if you saw that. Um, yeah, how do you communicate with non-academics? Was that yeah. the gist of it? it? Target audiences outside of academia, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Our, our kind of, we're planning a big rollout of this. Um, so, uh, you know, your suggestions welcome. Well, we're, we're going to plan a kind of a, a launch um, minus the in-person party, but a launch at some point in July um, where we do a kind of multi-pronged outreach. So outreach through uh, municipalities, maybe some kind of uh, written things, some like a um, Twitter, but uh, basically, 
we're still working on that part and kind of doing outreach mostly via municipalities. And our, um, so Sustainability Solutions Group is the, is the co-op that I work for. And that's where, like, if you wanted to give us feedback, there's venues, you can either uh, email me or email us. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat too. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like we have uh, maybe one last question. Uh, Pam Reiner asked uh, if there is API access to the data. We would like there to be. Um, the idea is that this is as transparent as possible, as open as possible. Um, and so we're working on putting together, like on sharing everything. We don't have API access at the moment. We'll have um, downloadable files, but there right now isn't like an automated way to grab everything. I don't know if, um, Marcus, who's here and in the group, if you want to add anything to that about the API stuff. <sighs> Sorry to put you on the spot. If if not, just say no. <laughs> uh, you're welcome to, to join the podium or, or put it in the chat. <laughs> oh, I think uh, not yet. Coming, coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you very much. If, if anybody else has questions or wants to engage further, um, uh, Donna will be in the poster session for the rest of the time here, and uh, that would be a good way to, to interact. Um, thanks so much. That was thanks. great. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, up next, uh, the next speaker is Mark Lozano. Hi, Mark. Hey there. All righty. I will try to share my screen first. And then hopefully it'll work. Yeah, maybe just uh, give people a, a sense or two about who you are. Yeah, my name is Mark Lozano. I'm a PhD candidate in the Energy Systems Program at the University of California, Davis. Um, seems like my, my Chrome doesn't want to share my screen. Sorry. One second. Sorry, I didn't realize this would be an issue. No, it's okay. Um, maybe we, maybe while you sort that out, we can play uh, Alicia Helmrich's uh, video yes. and then bring you back. That would up. be okay. great. Yeah, thank you. Ron, if we could do that, that would be fantastic. Um, Alicia also is having technical difficulties, but we have, I believe, a video uh, to play of her presentation. Hello, my name is Alicia Helmrich, and I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Sustainable Engineering in the Built Environment at Arizona State University. This project, Centralization and Decentralization for Resilient Infrastructure and Complexity, poster number 176, if you would like to check it out in more detail, was a group effort of Dr. Mike Chester's lab during our weekly brown bag meetings over the course of the past year. Basically, we were having conversations and realized that infrastructure literature that we were each reading were using concepts of centralization and decentralization in numerous ways. At times, it was referring to the physical networks and at others, institutional governance. Furthermore, it was infrequently defined. We set out to understand how the concepts are referenced in space and explore how centralization and decentralization could potentially increase adaptive capacity so infrastructure, particularly the power, water, and transportation sectors, could better respond to complex environments. For a high-level overview of our findings regarding how the concepts are defined in infrastructure literature, first, centralized versus decentralized networks are often characterized by proximity to resources, capacity of distribution, volume of product, and number of connections. Meanwhile, centralization versus decentralization of governance within infrastructure sectors is characterized by the number of actors who hold decision-making power. Notably, governance structures are frequently overlooked in infrastructure literature. Further, the configuration of a network does not necessarily determine the configuration of governance and vice versa. We provide a few examples in figure three. A couple Takeaways from this exploration of examples is that first, the identified system boundary or scale makes a significant impact of your perception of the system. Second, information flows further complicate context. For instance, coupling legacy infrastructure with emerging communication technologies. So 
We build upon existing literature in computer science that identifies a distributed network, one where all producers and consumers cooperate toward achieving a common goal. And we define this as a further subset of decentralization in infrastructure networks. Given the polysemy, we propose a dynamic multidimensional framing as seen in figure four of centralization, decentralization, and distributed systems through a coupled network governance perspective with information as a mediator. Information flows are increasingly powerful forces that are able to create new connections between your producers and consumers, as well as other emerging stakeholders such as activists and lobbyists. All in the meanwhile, information is continuing to mediate the existing relationships in infrastructure systems. By empowering more producers and or consumers with information and therefore sense making, as well as decision making power to act, a system can more readily respond to instances of instability or failure. We explore this assertion by investigating conditions where centralization or decentralization may increase resilience, as defined by the seven principles from Biggs in 2012. In figure five, we see that there is no silver bullet and both configurations contribute toward resilience. Although decentralization appears to be more closely aligned with the resilience principles, there are instances where increased centralization may be warranted. Particularly, increased centralization appears beneficial when circumstances require greater levels of coordination and or an understanding of the entire system. This dichotomy is likely to have limits. For example, at some point, a network can become decentralized to the point of being unmanageable by a more centralized governance structure. So this work has been very recently published. Currently, there is a preprint available, so I will share the link in the chat. But lastly, I would like to plug poster number 173 as well, which presents work on how biomimicry at a systems level could help advance resilient infrastructure design. So thank you all for your time, and I can now take any questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions in the chat, uh, please send it again. Uh, otherwise, you can reach out to to Alicia in the email address that she put in the chat. Uh, or you can jump up on the podium and ask. Um, yeah, if not, uh, I think that we we're having a, a little bit of technical difficulties with one of the poster presenters, but we I think are, are okay for uh, Jonas Boom to present. Uh, so hopefully we can bring him to the podium. Okay. Hey, um, Jonas. Uh, Jonas hi. is going to uh, present on the business of electric vehicles, the platform perspective. Uh, he's currently between positions on continent. So we're excited that he can join us. Uh, currently, he's a management thinker and strategic advisor. Welcome, Jonas. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and also to present on that, I think, very important topic. As you said, um, I'm in between positions, I'm in between continents, um, presenting um, a topic of in-betweens. So basically the transition from ICE vehicles to um, electric vehicles Perfect. and what you can learn um, from the platform perspective here. And I try to share my screen. Hope that works. Okay, I hope you, you can um, that looks great. All see my screen. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, um, I present today um, some broader research on the topic of what we can learn from, pl from the uh, platform perspective for the transition um, of um, electric vehicles. Um, I'm doing that on, on the behalf of also my co-authors, um, Hammond Bagava and Geoffrey Parker. We are all researchers and in industry um, on the topic of platforms. And we saw the need or we, we saw a gap of um, the understanding of basically platform dynamics and how it could be applied for the uh, transformation in the electric vehicle businesses. Um, and since then it's like work is ongoing for I'd say two to three years by now. Um, we wrote a couple of fundamental uh, fun foundational pieces um, and we are also now more or less on a, on its pre to um, disseminate the knowledge. So what I want to do um, in the next, I think, 10 to 15 minutes is giving an overview of, so what's the summary of that, but also what is the motivation and the background while we started, um, highlight 
what we can learn from the theory, um, from the, like the strong theory of, of platforms and platform strategies for EV businesses, um, and also where you can actually apply a lot of this theory um, in the future for future transformations. So the, um, the four most important things that uh, we always highlight when we are going out and, and explaining our research is that first of all, um, electric vehicles, um, as other vehicles as well, are platform goods. Um, and what does it mean? It means that the vehicle himself, uh, the vehicles themselves, um, are only part of an overall system that creates value. In order to be fully valuable or in, in order to create full value for the users, um, you also need complementary providers, complementary goods. Um, and in the case of electric vehicles, this is most not notably at the moment, the charging infrastructure. So the value of, a, of an electric vehicle um, increases with a network of charging stations. And this fundamental, fundamental architecture that the good itself, um, the value of the good itself is not only based on the good, but also on a lot of other complementary products resembles very closely the theory um, of platforms. And what we say is in order to um, have a successful transition from um, ICE vehicles to electric vehicles, you need to understand platform strategies um, and you can build on a very broad um, theory of, of platforms and learn from that. And that's what I'm presenting here today. So platform strategies are essential, especially um, because the temporal and structural differences in network effects at the moment um, make platforms, platform strategies really crucial. I will then highlight three strategic dimensions that are um, extremely important at the moment um, in the overall industry. That is first that the core of, of platforms is that there's a platform coordinator and the platform coordinator is um, the entity that coordinates between two or more sites. And um, in, in the EV industry, it is at the moment between like the coordination between um, the vehicle side and the charging network sites. Then um, it becomes increasingly important to understand how to launch into a platform. Um, business strategies, especially when you only have a, a single product, um, differ, very, differ starkly from how you would launch platform products. Just because you have a lot of different sites to start on and the decision where to start on and how to start it um, differs from conventional uh, management wisdom. Um, and then the other big question um, industry has to ask themselves or the players is how open their their platform will become, how open their networks will become. And then I'm in the end, I'm gonna highlight a little bit um, what future platform architecture good goods exist and why it is still beneficial to understand platform strategies um, to to advance um, these these transitions. So oh. That was too fast. So yeah, um, just very briefly, I already touched on it, um, the, the background and motivation, why we think um, the combination of platform thinking um, for the electrical vehicle industry at the moment is really important is, first of all, um, we see that the industry resembles platform architectures, but what we can also see at the same time is that the strategies of the players in the industry mostly doesn't um, act on act on this. So um, most of the industry players act as if they were in a totally different business um, and typically lack in, in their success. At the same time, there is a very strong theoretical backbone that, that we can build on um, that can help us to understand um, and improve the, the business strategies and ultimately improve the transition from, from ICE to electric vehicles. And um, we have great examples and empirical data at the moment out there because a lot of companies, um, both incumbent OEMs as well as new entrants, um, showcase what you know what the different strategies can be and, and um, what you probably shouldn't do. And we are at the moment, um, yeah, in the honest, pre to disseminate some of our findings 
uh, we wrote a couple of uh, papers about it um, and yeah also this uh, being here and, and presenting to all of you is, is part of that as i said um, before it helps to get at least a brief or high level understanding of what we mean by platforms um, a lot of you might have a working understanding of what the you know what a platform is um, uber airbnb facebook and so on often um, the the poster childs of uh, the platform economy um, but the fundamentals of platforms go a little bit deeper um, or go a little bit more general and for us um, platform businesses are the ones that facilitate interactions between different types of users um, and that they can start exchange something of value and importantly uh, platform businesses frequently harness network effects so network effects are effects where um, the existence of one side um, improves the value um, of, of the, the good on the other side so platform <coughs> strategies um, are essential at the moment in the ev industry and that is because of three reasons first of all network effects are very crucial um, at the moment and what does it mean it means that um, we have um, a virtual cycle or um, a flywheel effect where the number of charging stations contributes to the value of the car and and vice versa so um, the value um, the number of stations increases the value to car owners um, this increases uh, the potentially the number of cars on the road this um, increases the number uh, the value to the stations because there's um, a higher utilization um, at the stations and this in turn increases potentially the number of stations so this is in on a very high level these are network effects um, and network effects are one critical aspect of, of uh, platform strategies at the same time, we see at the moment um, temporal differences in network effects, for example, compared to gasoline cars. So gas for gasoline cars, the, the network effects on the left side um, are also true, but they are not as much true. So basically today, everybody who drives an ICE um, doesn't really care, or doesn't really, um, yeah, doesn't really care how many, um, fueling stations out there because you know there are enough that's not the case uh, for electric cars at the moment so on the trajectory on the this trajectory electric cars are just in a different place at the moment which increases the importance of understanding how to manage um, this kind of uh, yeah, disequilibria so at the moment for electric cars it is much more important to manage both sides the network and the cars at the same time, um, while it is not the same for gasoline cars. So what are we, what do we, what do we talk about um, now in terms of what is a platform um, and what are the, what is a platform business in electric vehicles? Um, we see that a lot of um, incumbents. Um, both on the electric car side and on the charging station side, um, only have kind of a partially, uh, only partially um, compatible, uh, basically non-coordinated. So there's a there's a lack of of a platform as a coordinator um, between these two sides. So the um, OEMs design their cars, design their strategies to to sell cars. Um, and the, the um, EV charging network providers, um, they are designing their strategies to create uh, charging networks. What is missing is the integration of these two um, and the, the coordination of the, the rollout on both sides. Luckily, um, especially luckily for us to showcase uh, what we mean is Tesla is a counter example to that. So Tesla, um, does a pretty good job in understanding the the platform dynamics of this market and what tesla is doing is basically acting as a platform as a coordinator between the two sides of um 
the electric car and EV charging stations. As you might know, Tesla is rolling out their own, um, or yeah, or it did, and is uh, currently still rolling out their um, proprietary charging station network. At the same time, um, as they are rolling out um, basically their cars, um, producing cars and, and selling cars. And we're gonna um, jump a little bit deeper into and give a uh, give a little uh, a couple of examples of where that is beneficial for Tesla um, in in um, selling the system of uh, electric mo uh, mobility. So what we highlight is that the industry needs to um, focus on on three strategic dimensions or has three de key decisions to make. Um, that is first, the industry needs to find um, a platform coordinator or multiple ones, but you need to find somebody who coordinates um, um, the two sides of uh, network and vehicles. They need to solve for the so-called chicken and egg problem. The problem that the one side um, is basically not fully uh, valuable without the other side um, and where to start and how to uh, create the incentives to um, to grow both sides um, at the same time. And then the critical decision of how open do you want to make both both sides of the market. So how open do you want to make the network and how open um, should the vehicles be? On the um, finding a platform coordinator side, it is um, important to note that these cross-site network effects, so the, the, the value exchange between network and vehicle side, make it absolutely necessary to coordinate these sides. So, that is true for uh, compatibility. Um, a lot of things happen on the compatibility side already. So uh, basically the plugs, uh, that the plugs are compatible, but there is more to that. So coordinating, for example, real time access to charging stations, um, coordinating the network design, um, coordinating um, the basically the rollout timing of, of networks. So. Tesla, for example, um, can coordinate the growth of both sides at the same time. They have information on um, their car sales. They have actually future, in the, the, I mean, forward-looking information on car sales and can um, build their network accordingly. Incumbents at the moment, um, as well as charging network operators, having very hard times to coordinating that at the moment because they are optimizing typically just for their own side and for their own business model and lacking um, a lot of crucial data to um, uh, to coordinate between the two, si two sides. And that makes Tesla as an overall system of electric mobil mobility at the moment superior to, to anything that you um, that you can see on uh, on the incumbent side. While you, for example, might have better cars um, coming out of the um, automotive OEMs by now or, or in the future, the overall system itself, um, so the electric mobility system consisting of the car and the charging network um, is still lacking behind. The second aspect is how to solve for the chicken and egg problem. So. Um, how do you, for example, incentivize as um, a vehicle OEM, a network provider to build out um, then the network because um, you, you need it as, um, as complementary good for your vehicles. So there are typically um, four different strategies um, that, you can, that you can see uh, or that, is, that are very well documented in the theories. Basically do it yourself. So that's a Tesla approach. Um, Form consortia. Uh, we've seen that in the industry already happening, um, albeit with not real success, relying on policymakers or relying on the market. Um, policymakers typically in platform markets um, also show that they are rather uh, lacking behind or, or slower. And the market typically um, is very, um, or is, is um, not a superior solution in coordinating between sites. Um, although that's what currently mostly happens is that 
both sides, both the OEMs and, uh, and the network providers, try or uh, hope that the market actually delivers what they need. Um, by applying a platform strategy, um, as for example, Tesla does, it provides additional freedom um, or strategic freedom for revenue models and, and choices of openness. So the do-it-yourself approach of Tesla um, enables them to, for example, cross-subsidize the, the one side of the market, so the network, um, by giving away free charging and, um, and yeah, making, making money on the car side, although they're not making money on the car side either at the moment. Uh, but this um, strategic freedom is uh, something that is not accessible if you're not applying a platform strategy as uh, the OEMs at the moment doing. So they can only make money um, on the car side and the um, network operators also need to make money on, on the network side if they don't coordinate. And the same um, is, is true for the choices of, of openness. Um, and I'm coming to that now. So choices of openness are a very, very important strategic um, uh, yeah, strategic uh, strategy for in, in network markets or in uh, platform markets. So if you apply uh, a platform strategy as Tesla does, they can at the moment decide if they keep their network closed. So uh, basically um, Tesla superchargers can only be accessed by uh, Teslas, while others, um, other network operators need to be open in order to increase their utilization. Um, and it gives Tesla the opportunity um, to switch sides. What does it mean? It, it means that um, Tesla has the strategic freedom to decide where they make money. Um, they could, for example, at some point decide our network is much more valuable than our car business. So they are giving um, away cars for free and making money on the network side. OEMs at the moment don't have that opportunity, but they need to decide, um, for example, do they create their own closed network? Do they cooperate? With whom are they um, cooperating? And the same is true for uh, the charging networks. How can they grow? Um, how close do they want to become uh, with the OEMs? How tightly do they want to coordinate? So that is um, on a very high level. These are the uh, three strategic dimensions that um, players in the industry are facing at the moment. And um, what we are showcasing um, in, in our research is they especially just need to embrace platform thinking in, in order to grow the, um, the EV business and contribute to a successful transformation. Um, yeah, and um, I think we are probably running a little bit out of time. Um, platform theories, um, can help understanding the, the transformation in a lot of other future um, disequilibria in industries um, because a lot of the same strategies or a lot of the same kind of characteristics um, will be seen if we are talking for um, hydrogen cars, for example, um, building out the charging network um, or the, the refueling network for, for hydrogen cars is basically exactly the same story um, as for um, EVs. And we will see that for automotive data and, and auto, uh, autonomous driving, but also um, a lot of other industries that are currently in, in disequilibria or in, in transformation um, would profit from a platform perspective, namely IoT, smart cities, decentralized energy systems, where it helps a lot to understand how um, yeah, platform architecture markets perform and what you can learn from the strategies that exist there. So by that, um, I'm happy to take questions. And now I need to stop sharing. Hey, Jonas, that was great. Um, we've opened up a podium. So hopefully uh, anybody with a question can either step up or ask in the chat. Uh, I have not looked at the chat to see if, if there are any. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jonas, for the presentation. 
Uh, I had a few questions. Um, the first one is, uh, how do you know at what level you should stop the platform architecture when you're looking at it? Um, for example, you showed that you were looking at the electric vehicles and the charging stations only. What if you go further, uh, for example, to see to look at the price of electricity when you have an increased demand and deploying more uh, stations, charging stations? Um, that could decrease the value of your electric vehicles. So when, where, how do you define this threshold that you're looking at? So I, I don't know if I fully understand um, your question. And could could you repeat what you what do you mean yeah. by? Yeah. So so basically, uh, you looked at only the vehicles and the charging stations. Yes. Right. So what if you also continue looking at what if you have more charging stations? You would have more demand for electricity, therefore your price would increase. Um, and then so, the yeah. value okay. of the would decrease, right? Yes. Um, so, so what I presented is, is basically um, a conceptual argument, um, and you can ex extend that conceptual argument to actually a lot of other subsequent platform markets. And what you what you described is a, is another one, right? So basically. Um, and that's what we the, the question we, we often like often get asked is okay what what how do you combine now the electric vehicles with um, the energy system right and then the decentralized energy system um, and how do you combine for example battery solar and so on at stations right so yes and this the it's true the logic stays the same, right? So you actually, what you do is you are adding an additional complementary good. Um, so basically adding an additional network effect, um, but the strategies, and that's what we are doing is looking at business strategies and, and industry strategies. They are kind of staying the same. It gets more complex, um, but they're staying, they're staying the same and the logic stays the same. Um, and you can get into that thinking and you can apply that thinking um, in order to, arrive at business strategies that actually resemble reality and not um, yeah, something that you kind of made up. Yeah, That's thanks. what we are trying to say. Thanks. Yeah. And do we have time if I can ask another question? Yeah, please, go ahead. Okay, uh, and basically uh, in, the, in the design of the manufacturer themselves, I guess uh, with your presentation, you were representing the manufacturer's perspective, uh, more of the government or decision maker's perspective, let's say. Um, so basically, uh, in your design as a manufacturer, would they consider also what decisions would be made, for example, from a government standpoint, uh, where profitability isn't really exactly the utmost uh, goal? So the, the problem, so the, yes, so the short answer is yes. The long answer is, at the moment, um, coordination only happens on, on certain aspects in that industry, right? So coordination, for example, happened on, on the plug side. So you have kind of a standardization uh, that happened um, on, on, on the plug itself. Um, but for example, there's no, no real government standardization on uh, the, inform, um, the communication protocols, for example. Um, so there is still coordination together. And that's what we call then the, the platform owner or a platform entity that coordinates, for example, um, the, the communication protocol between charging station and the car and um, the basically the, um, the usability layer. So real time availability, reservation of charging station and so on. Um, so somebody um, can step in and take that role or governments can do that also later. Um, and, and coordinate here and say, okay, that's the standard that we are building on. The problem that we typically see is if you don't understand that you have this standardization and these network effects in an industry and you optimize only for one side, um, you're basically bound to fail. So if, if an OEM uh, designs their car to have the best specs um, that a car can have, but misses the point that you actually need to have a, com a compatible network, then typically um, you will fail. And this network exists on different levels. It's just a technical level, so the plugs, it's the charging speeds, uh, but at the same time, it's uh, the density, it's um, the geographical dispersion, it is um, 
communication protocols, and so on and so on. So yeah, that's. Um, Thank you very much. Um, if there are additional questions, please join us on the podium or, or type it into the chat. Um, out of curiosity, I think we, I watched uh, it go from, from night to day behind you, over your shoulder. Uh, where, where are you joining us from? Um, I'm, I'm sitting in Sydney at the moment. Sydney. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, Thanks. So it's, yeah. Thanks uh, for, yeah. Thanks for jumping into the surf soon. <laughs> nice. Thanks for joining us uh, so early in the morning. Um, any any additional questions for Jonas? Uh, well, we have uh, one one last poster uh, presentation that we are having some technical difficulties. So if you have additional questions, please reach out to Jonas. I think he'll be uh, maybe around for the rest of the the session, which goes another ten or twelve minutes. Um, yes. But thanks again. That was a, a great talk. Really appreciated it. Hi again. <laughs> hey, Mark. Uh, let me see if I can make this happen. Uh, if I share, nope, it's not an option. I can share a Chrome tab though, and I have your presentation open. Are you able to see your presentation? Yes, I see it. Uh, let me fit that to the page. Uh, Thank you. Derek. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll try to keep up with you. Um, I'll let you know when we can move on to the next one. Uh, let me see what happens if I enter full screen. Uh, that probably didn't do anything for you. I can see it pretty clearly. I'm guessing it should be fine for everybody. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, hi again, everybody. My name is Mark. I am a PhD candidate in the Energy Systems Program at the University of California, Davis. And this is my poster dissected into a presentation on promoting environmental equity and climate planning. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll see the research that kind of motivated today's presentation. We had previously developed marginal abatement cost curves for two jurisdictions in California. Those were Yolo County and Los Angeles County. What we did was we pulled emissions reduction strategies that they had proposed in their climate action plans and we calculated the life cycle emissions reduction and the life cycle cost for these strategies, which can then be presented here to compare those um, expected emissions reductions and expected cost of the strategies. Um, and while this is definitely a helpful tool for jurisdictions to compare strategies and um, consider them in terms of prioritization, one major drawback of these abatement cost curves is that they don't consider the actual impacts of strategy implementation on specific individuals or communities, which then prompted today's research, which is looking at the equity implications of these considered strategies. This is basically split into two research questions, which are on the next slide. On the first question, I wanted to look at the extent to which equity is currently considered in climate action plans. So to do this, I developed a pseudo quantitative metric to assign a score for each climate action plan based on the extent to which it considered equity. And then I explored correlations between these scores and demographic data on these jurisdictions that I pulled from the US Census. And then I repeated this process for the inclusion of emissions data as well as cost data. Then the second question, or really the second goal was to develop a set of questions or a framework that could be used by CAP developers to integrate equity more easily into their CAPs to again help promote um, these themes as they approach climate change mitigation. On the next slide, we'll see the metric that I used to score the inclusion of equity emissions and cost. You are free to come back to this and look at it later on your own time. But again, I assigned a score to 32 different climate action plans across the state of California. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see the correlations that I was able to find using a linear regression model. And what we'll see is that there are a few correlations for the inclusion of equity and the inclusion of emissions. But one thing that was standard across the board is that year or really the time that the cap was released was a major influence on um, including these data. So specifically, more recent caps were more likely to have higher amounts of equity emissions and cost data. So um, that was one major takeaway. And you can see on the right hand side the different demographic data that we had considered. 
again, we can come back to this later. Um, so moving from there, I again wanted to dive a little bit deeper into what exactly it means to be equitable as a climate action plan or to have an equitable climate approach. And so I started splitting this into more specific terms that could still be applied across the board. And so here we could develop scores for the inclusion of co-benefits or the extent to which the jurisdiction engaged the community, as well as the extent to which they considered indigenous communities and tribal lands. But as I was reviewing these, these climate action plans and I was going through the literature and speaking with uh, members of these jurisdictions, we realized that there are many intricacies for the specific strategies when you looked sector by sector. And so on the next slide, I began developing questions that we could ask for specific sectors and consider those strategies independently just because there are so many, again, intricacies to um, the impacts that strategies in those sectors would have on the communities. So all in all, if we go to the last slide, we can look at a few of the takeaways, which was that caps seem to trend in more recent times to include higher um, levels or higher specificity of equity, as well as better quantitative data for both emissions and cost. And we realized that there are a lot of, again, intricacies within sectors that makes broader equity questions or broader equity frameworks insufficient to actually gauge the impacts that this implementation will have on communities. Now, after having compared these scores to demographic data, we realized that there aren't really strong ties, which leads to the question of what then does actually drive the inclusion of equity in these caps, and what about the inclusion of good quantitative data, specifically life cycle data. And this then prompts the next phase of my research, in which I'll be developing a survey that is aimed at cap developers to explore the factors that limit and or promote the inclusion of equity and life cycle data in CAPS. And what I'm hoping to find here are to identify the hurdles that they face and to identify where exactly are the opportunities for change and ways that we could begin to incorporate um, higher levels of data and specificity. So this is my work. Thank you so much. And thank you, Derek, for running my slides. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, um... Uh, back in the shindig app uh please uh feel free to join us on the podium but uh thanks again that was, that was an excellent talk um i was wondering i guess while we wait for uh, audience questions if you could uh you mentioned hurdles uh what would you if you could recommend one thing to uh generically uh, uh, somebody who's considering creating a climate action plan what would you recommend to make sure that that um yeah, that, that the climate action plan is, is more uh, inclusive. One major thing that I noted is that community engagement is just really integral. Um, a lot of communities will engage the community, or rather a lot of jurisdictions will engage their community members when they're in the early planning phase and will say, this is what our climate action plan is going to look like, or this is what we intend it to be. And so there is a period of input where community members can come in. Um, of course, there are issues in terms of which community members you can reach and who is actually available to attend these meetings, whether virtual or in person, you know, given the circumstances. But another shortcoming is that there is often not enough reporting back to the community on what the results are of these actions. And so you will have input on creating the action plan, but not a lot of feedback on how it's going and continuous opportunities for the community to give back. And so I think that that is one pretty straightforward way that you could make sure that as a jurisdiction, you're meeting the needs of your community without necessarily burdening, burdening certain parts of it more than others. Um, would you have any, following up on that, any specific recommendations to for uh, how in the planning phase they could uh, planners could maintain um, that sort of community engagement that you're talking about? Um, I think if you had an annual meeting where you reflected on the certain impacts that you've seen over the last year, where exactly the money has gone and what are tangible um, milestones that you've reached, I think that's a good way to keep the community engaged. Obviously not all milestones will be tangible, you know, especially when you talk about 
and carbon emissions reductions. You know, that's pretty hard to quantify year to year, but um, I do think that there could be ways to continuously engage the community um, and, and just request feedback or, you know, just what their experience has been like if there is something in terms of land use or in terms of transportation that um, they could deal with on like a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, uh, thanks, that's great. Um, I'll just see if in the last couple of minutes here, if anybody in the audience has any questions for, uh, for Mark or for any of our presenters, um, feel free to type that in the chat or join us on the podium. Give it a, another 20 seconds or so. Um, you guys are pretty close to end of the session anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, the timing, timing was great. Uh, and yeah, yeah if, if anybody has any questions for Mark, you'll be around for the rest of the day and tomorrow, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, oh, somebody in the chat is uh, uh, talking about another uh, session, but um, or another presentation. But yeah, uh, thanks so much for your time and glad that we got the technical issues sorted out and that you were yes, able to, you. to present. And thanks to everybody for uh, coming to the second poster session. I uh, feel like we were in a virtual setting able to to pull this off nicely. Um, wanna once again, thank our sponsors, Earthship Global, and uh, wanted to thank all of the presenters for uh, sharing their research with us. So uh, thanks to, to everybody and we'll see you at the next session. Thank you.